Now, on to the event of today, and Eddie Chu, who received more votes than anyone else for his constituency in running for LegCo. We've had a bit of a reprieve from Hong Kong politics, uh, day in and day out. Instead, we've been worrying about the pain of the pound or uh, watching tabloid TV in the form of the US presidential debates. But uh, tomorrow, we have the oath taking for LegCo. Uh, the season is already underway. And as most of you are well aware, we have a whole new generation of politicians coming into LegCo. So what kind of politics is that going to lead to in an already relatively bitter atmosphere in Hong Kong? Well, we're very, very pleased to have Eddie Chu here, who's an incoming legislative counselor. He's very well known for his social activism around Hong Kong, starting uh, with the Star Ferry uh, issue, which he was very involved in, and also in terms of grouping with villagers in Choi Yun in the new territories around housing developments there. Eddie will speak, and then we'll have time for Q&A. It's my pleasure to welcome Eddie Chu. This is the first time I am invited to give a speech in English. <laughs> <laughs> and my assistant helped me to write a um, long script. <laughs> but my friend uh, told me not to use it. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I better uh, talk about myself and my campaign for 15 minutes and then we can take questions and that can be a very um, more vibrant um, communication between us. Uh, actually, I think uh, uh, I, was uh, I was invited here because um, uh, nobody understand why I got so much votes, so many votes. <laughs> Do you know how many votes I got? I got uh, more than 84,000 votes uh, in my constituency. That is the New Territory West constituency. So um, I myself and uh, my friends and my team and uh, friends from the media are also um, uh, trying to figure out what, what's happened behind behind this. So um, I will try to I will try to give uh, two reasons, two reasons, and then I will try to talk about um, uh, my relationship, maybe um, Hong Kong Democratic Movement the relationship between Hong Kong Democratic Movement and China's one. So um, first of all, uh, what we have in our political movement uh, uh, in the last 30 years is, um, is something quite passive. And you may not know that uh, in the early 1980s and 90s when we have uh, when we started to have elections uh, on the district council level and, and we have a uh, semi-open election uh, in the legislative council. Actually, nobody fought for that. Nobody fought for uh, uh, opening up of the uh, representative institution in Hong Kong. But the British colonial government gave us, for what reason, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's uh, kind of try to build a better democratic window for uh, negotiation. But um, what happened afterwards <clears throat> was that we have political parties, uh, we have uh, all sorts of elections, just as if uh, Hong Kong is a full democracy. But uh, actually, we are um, <clears throat> in, the, in a fight for uh, universal suffrage. So what happened is um, we have political parties, but we don't have a strong democratic movement. And Beijing, with uh, British government, uh, planned for us from the uh, signing of the Joint Declaration to uh, what we had in 2014, the, uh, the, the decision by, N by, by N NPC. MPC and National People's Congress Standing Committee uh, to de determine what we could have uh, for our uh, chief executive 
election. So uh, we didn't know, I mean, we didn't, but pan Democrats in Hong Kong, uh, although we have a vision, but we actually didn't know how to fight for democracy in Hong Kong. So what happened is uh, all the way along, we were led by the Beijing government, uh, timetable were, were set by them, decision were made by them. So until 2014, what happened, everyone knew after the uh, 31st of August decision, uh, there was the umbrella movement. The umbrella movement actually um, started by uh, students, and I, I, I knew that Joshua Wong was once here talking about his experience. Uh, the most important thing uh, in umbrella movement was that uh, people uh, were fed up with uh, all the promises Beijing <coughs> gave us. And starting from our young generations, we started to think out of the box. And the box is the basic law and all the <coughs> decisions made by uh, MPC. So what do we mean by uh, think out of the box is that if Hong Kong, <coughs> if Hong Kong wants to design our own future, then maybe we can throw away or just think less about the basic law first and to think freely about what we can have for our future. So, <coughs> Uh, advocates for independence of Hong Kong came out uh, from our younger generation. And I myself, I am an advocate for democratic self-determination of Hong Kong people. Uh, the right of democratic self-determination is actually seized from us uh, in early 1980s, before the joint declaration uh, was signed between uh, the two countries. So what we have is, it's like, so we were betrayed by the two governments, and then we have 30 years of democratic movement, weak one, uh, which was all in vain. And then young people say that, okay, um, although 30 years uh, were, uh, <coughs> were missed, we can do it all over again. So we talk about, so we, we, we every, everyone now, I um, mean the young, younger generation are now talking about things or discussions uh, 30 years ago, taking them back uh, to 2016 and to be the political platform of this uh, legislative council election. And I am part of it. So uh, I got, uh, I think most of my support uh, from the younger generation that think that uh, we need a new way of doing politics. We need a new vision for our um, uh, uh, future political system of Hong Kong. And they will also want us to be distinguished from the pan-democrats. They want us to, uh, to group ourselves together to be, uh, sorry, to make a paradigm shift from the pan-democrats to uh, self-determination. So uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I am, uh, we, there, are, there are actually six of us who, are, uh, who have uh, similar thoughts uh, out of uh, 30, and I hope that uh, I can have more uh, <coughs> colleagues from the pan-democrats. Uh, for example, uh, actually, my range of options for self-determination is uh, quite wide. Um, from independence to a change of basic law, certain articles, for example, Article 158 uh, and 159, that give uh, the power to Beijing to amend and interpret our basic law. So this power, we should take it back. If that's, ta if that's taken back, then I think many Hong Kong people will say that, well, one country and two system is still okay. We can still stay in China. So uh, what I'm proposing is we need a wide range of 
choices in front of us. And the basic principle is Hong Kong people's future should not be decided by Beijing government. So <clears throat> that's, I think, the first reason why I, I got support from Hong Kong people. Second, um, for the six of us, uh, the six uh, legislative councillors who are advocating for independence or self-determination, actually we, are, we have two strays. Uh, one, uh, I, was, I, will, I will call them uh, nationalist self-determinationists. Well, well, it's too complicated, sorry. Uh, they are from the right wing. They, they, I think uh, they, are, um, they are also part of the trend, a global, global trend uh, of the rise of right wing, and, but they, uh, with Hong Kong context. Uh, for them, well, Hong Kong people uh, have the right to self-determining determination. Uh, but for the problem of the society, the major problem is all those Chinese new immigrants who came to Hong Kong in this 10 or 20 years. They made all the problems. Problems about housing, about social welfare, about everything. So uh, their approach <coughs> to this problem is first to build a Hong Kong nation first and to distinguish from real Hong Kong people from fake ones. And <coughs> I'm not I do not agree with them. I do not agree with them. And so what, I, what am I? I, um, I will describe me as um, using, uh, using an example in, the, in Europe, the leftist party in Spain, Podemos. Podemos, uh, Podemos is for me, um, the, the form of uh, politics that Hong Kong can uh, regain the momentum of democratic movement. Uh, Podemos, uh, the party in, in, in Spain, tried to, um, try to mobilize the general public in political participation. The, the, the membership is very easy to, to receive, uh, just a registration on the website, and then they can have uh, small groups uh, in communities, so there are I think more than more than thirty thousand circles, and that is community groups which tries to uh, deal with local issues and try to get involved in local politics. Um, actually, my whole campaign is uh, a copycat of Vote Podemos. Uh, what I did, uh, what I did was um, I uh, stated out I, I had no money. Uh, for my campaign, I have no people helping me, just uh, two, two to three. And what I did uh, was I proposed, I, I, I stated out in my Facebook page that, oh, I am an advocate for democratic self-determination, and I love the environment, and I want to protect the rural environment, and I love to see the revival of local agriculture, so on and so forth. So. Um, and then I uh, made a call to uh, recruit uh, volunteers, and I have uh, around 50 of them, 50 of them um, for uh, in the first stage. So I divided them into groups um, according to the district they uh, they live in. So I have uh, then I have 10 groups uh, of volunteers, one uh, with uh, five to six members, and and after uh, four months, uh, this uh, 50. Uh, volunteers has developed into uh, a network of uh, five to six hundred uh, volunteers that are not only helping me uh, for my victory, and but also we are quite um, eager to start uh, uh, from tomorrow to be a major political uh, practice of Hong Kong. That means um, we want to uh, not only um, give a new vision to Hong Kong people of what we can have in the future, but also the way of organization. We also want to reform what uh, the pandemics are, are having right now. Uh, what they are having is a surface-oriented a surface mode of um, 
uh, doing elections. Uh, they have um, <clears throat> they have assistants, they have officers. They are receiving cases from uh, from from the weak in the society. Um, in return of in exchange of uh, votes in the election, maybe. Uh, but at the end, uh, our organization of uh, democratic movement has not been strengthened uh, through this model. So I want to uh, have a radical change or ra a radical change um, to this model. I try to open up my uh, campaign and open up my um, legislative council office uh, to include people as much as I can uh, in different districts. So I uh, build up a grassroots um, way of doing politics, and I hope um, I can start from uh, New Territory West and four years later, a uh, more geographical constituency can have uh, our, um, our friends over there and we can uh, build a bigger, uh, we, can, we can build a bigger political power by that. So uh, lastly, I just want to spend uh, two to three minutes about uh, relationship with uh, China. The problem, <clears throat> uh, that is, it is a quite uh, delicate uh, relationship between the democratic movement of Hong Kong and democratic movement in China. Uh, we had a very good relationship uh, before, I think, before 2010. Uh, when, during that time, uh, activists in mainland China will use Hong Kong's progress as a way to uh, promote their own cause in mainland China. Uh, they will say that, well, uh, Hong Kong is part of China, so uh, uh, if Hong Kong can have elections in legislative council, so we can have it too in mainland China. So it's kind of, I mean, interaction, positive interaction between uh, these two. So what happened after afterwards, um, I think it's also a strategy by, by uh, Beijing government, is they deliberately uh, try to uh, try to catalyze, try to catalyze or try to trigger uh, the rise of uh, independent movement in Hong Kong, or try to, um, try to uh, make it more famous. I mean, the, the right wing movement the right-wing localist movement in Hong Kong, uh, in order to break the two movements apart. The point, uh, what, what, we are, what we have right now is Chinese activists in mainland, they are very difficult to cooperate with uh, Hong Kong uh, politicians right now after the umbrella movement, because the, the whole umbrella movement and the development of politics afterwards uh, was treated by the mainland government as uh, separatism. As separatism, so uh, it it become more difficult for them to connect the two uh, with each other. And I think that's a plan uh, by the Beijing government. So, uh, what uh, me as an advocate for uh, democratic self determination? That's a problem I want to uh, resolve or I want to change. I at one. At one point, or on one hand, I will definitely defend uh, the rights of Hong Kong people for self-determination. But on the other hand, I do not agree that uh, democratic movement is not related to, democratic movement in mainland is not related to us at all. So I think uh, what I'm trying to do is to build a bigger uh, political party, or, or sorry, political network and a stronger, democratic movement in Hong Kong, and at the same time, we will have more connections with Taiwan, have more connections with mainland China, with, with Thai activists, which uh, have just denied the ent entry of Joshua Wong, uh, in order to uh, build a stronger network uh, in the fight uh, against a Communist Party in Beijing. So um, I will stop here first, so I want to take your question. Eddie, thank you very much for those remarks. We have about uh, 15 minutes plus for Q&A, and I'll start with Florence here and make sure we go around the room. 
Thank you, Florence de Changy, a correspondent for Le Monde. Um, Eddie, could you tell us, um, within the legal frame of Pledgeco, what can you achieve? Because we understand what you want to achieve, but the fact of being a member of Pledgeco gives you a little bit more power, but possibly not that much. My goal uh, within these four years is to uh, make the camp of self-determination as big as possible. And that is not a dream for me, uh, because even uh, for the younger members in big parties, uh, in the pan uh they are in certain ways also advocates for self-determination. Uh, they have signed a declaration of internal self-determination in early, earlier this year, saying that uh, <clears throat> we should have rights to change the basic law in order to strengthen uh, our, uh, our, our self-autonomy in Hong Kong. So <clears throat> to, to build this camp as strong as possible, uh, my major, <clears throat> my major uh, objective is to stop uh, the decision of Democratic Party to cooperate with Beijing government like what they did in 2010 to happen again. Uh, and at the, at the same time, on the other hand, uh, in my opinion, the, the only way for uh, Hong Kong people to have a real bargaining power with Beijing is to have the majority of the Legislative Council. So we, we have 30 seats uh, in this term, and I hope that in uh, four to eight years, we can achieve uh, the majority of the Legislative Council. So at that, that is the only chance for us to negotiate for any new arrangement of uh, the future of Hong Kong politics with uh, Beijing. Have you felt any pressure from the pro-establishment forces in the last few weeks leading up to the oath-taking tomorrow for LegCo? Oh, I, uh, the pressure I receive uh, is not that visible. I receive pressure from uh, mafia groups, actually, from uh, inside my constituency because um, I, I, was deep, I, I was deeply involved in land issue and I'm in conflict in conflict with uh, big land owners in the new territories. So uh, I will not treat it as uh, a, hinder for me, a hindrance for me not to take the oath or to, to, to stop the work I, I plan to do. Uh, my, my major idea uh, in, in the new territories is to reform the Heung Yi Kok, the major uh, landlord uh, organization in the new territories in a democratic way so we can have more voices that support uh, the environment uh, to be represented in it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chas Dung from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, based at uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, because Eddie, you have been to an advocate outside the establishment for quite a while, maybe a near a decade. So what will you perceive your role, the difference of a role between like before as beyond outside the establishment and now part of the establishment. And, that, and then what we perceive some challenges or maybe compromise you may have to make uh, in the upcoming years. And then secondly, maybe quite related to the first questions, uh, given the legislative council, basically the whole rule of game is not quite fair. And then even the different type of voting and that sort of thing is it's just not fair. And some of the pro, pro establishment Lawmaker not really respect the due process. So, how did you make a change, or yeah, and your strategy as a game changer? Uh, for the first question, um, uh, well, I think after the there is a major shift of focus uh, in politics of Hong Kong uh, from social movement to political movement. And the umbrella movement is the watershed for that. So you, you, we are witnessing a trend, not only me uh, as, uh, as a social activist who joined the Legislative Council election. Um, many of them, many of the localists who, 
who who are her outside institution are also joining the uh, election uh, of legislative council. And I think um, the reason behind this trend is uh, the establishment. I mean, the pan democrat establishment are falling apart. So there is they are leaving a big hole for us to fill in, and we and I feel obliged to join this election campaign because uh, if I miss this chance, then I miss a very crucial chance to tell Hong Kong people because this is the first time uh, in Hong Kong history that uh, legislative uh, council election really deal with uh, political issues. I mean different uh, political agenda are set in front of Hong Kong people to decide. So, uh, so there is a shift of focus, and I am obliged to, to, to take part in it. Secondly, um, uh, all of you know that I, uh, we have no power, um, even in Legislative Council. So uh, what I plan to do, first of all, is uh, I will be a new speaker because I, I, I work as a journalist uh, since, since my graduation, and, I, and I'm still uh, an, an, an editor of, of a news website. So uh, I think uh, legislative councillor, uh, uh, in particular the, the opposition, they can take a bigger role in, in, in exposing uh, all sorts of collusions between uh, different power networks, and that can make us, um, I mean, that can make us more relevant. So this is the first thing I will do. Second, second thing is uh, some of the issues that I try to bring up are still new issues for the Legislative Council, just like the reformation of Hang Yi Kok I am proposing. So uh, there are still room for, I mean, opening up discussions for certain issues, and I hope I can uh, let Hong Kong people uh, be more aware of the collusion of landlord and mafia groups and, and, and the government, in particularly in the new territories, because uh, the future of the new territories, the rural environment, decides what Hong Kong will be. Um, thank you. Janelino from the Australian Consulate. Um, you mentioned your desire to change the basic law. So my question is, by what mechanism would you get the NPC to adopt amendments to the basic law? Because as I understand it, that is the only way that it can be amended. And secondly, is there not a danger in reopening the basic law that Beijing might actually try to change some of the other articles such as freedom of speech or education or academic freedom um, as well as liberalising something like Article 158? Thank you. Well, uh, for the Chinese government, everything is not about procedure. <laughs> it's about power, political power. And I think, uh, so our responsibility is to get as much power as we can. So that's the only way. So I, I, what I'm talking about is I, I, I do not agree that kind of de facto referendum proposed by uh, other political groups, because I, I don't think that, it, that will give a real threat to Beijing. Uh, the real threat is, as I've said, majority in the Legislative Council. The, this is the only way. So I hope um, more things can be done uh, in the functional constituency. Uh, for, this, for this term, this election, uh, we have not uh, working hard enough in registration of certain in certain functional constituencies like the like the catering uh, seat, so uh, we will plan it earlier. So uh, hopefully, if we can have uh, one or two more seats next time in the geographical constituency and three more seats in the functional constituency, then we can achieve our goal. So at that time, we will talk about how to make change on what article and whatever. So for the, so the, second, um, for the second question, um, my good friend uh, Margaret Ng, uh, the former legislator, always 
uh, remind me of this pawn. Uh, but I think that um, the problem we are facing now is uh, uh, we can wait no longer to, 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 we cannot keep ourselves stuck in this situation. Um, we will, young people cannot wait and they will, I mean, they will break, I mean, I mean uh, um, much more uh, violent actions will be taken if we do not, I mean, uh, if we do not draw the power or, or draw the attention to the political process in legislative council and social movement. So uh, I, I, I would rather take the risk than not doing anything. We'll go over to the veranda here and then come back. Uh, hello, Andrew Wood from BBC News. And I find politics in Hong Kong very difficult because there isn't any. All you talk about is pro-establishment or um, pan-democrat, uh, self-determination. Nobody ever talks about what you would do with that self-determination. In America, you have the Republicans and you have the Democrats. Now, okay, perhaps the Republican side at the moment is a bit weird. But on the whole, you know in America what Democrats stand for, what Republicans stand for. You know in the UK what the Labour Party stands for, what the Conservatives stand for, left wing, right wing. I have no idea in Hong Kong what anybody stands for. Are you in favor of higher taxes, lower taxes, a welfare okay. state, reformation? <laughs> so there's a lot of questions, so I... Yes. I mean, what do you stand for? What are you going to do with this self-determination? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, but I mean, it's also, I, I, I'm sorry to, to, to tell you that uh, our situation is pretty much like Taiwan. So we have, uh, we have uh, pro-unification and pro-independence. So in Hong Kong, pro-Beijing and, uh, and, and pro-democracy is... But what's the point having democracy, more democracy, self-determination, if you don't actually have any policies for people to vote for? Actually, um, within, the, within the camp of uh, uh, the pandemic and also the self-determination, we, uh, we have in our political platforms uh, ideas about economy, about uh, uh, preservation of the environment, about social welfare. But the problem for, I think, is quite difficult for uh, foreign journalists to make sense out of it because uh, the major issues, the major issues put uh, uh, on, on the front page is always about uh, uh, pro or against Beijing. So Beijing, I think, is also responsible for, for making this um, impression. So, uh, I, will, I will, if you have time, talk more about my ideas, about economy, about all, all sort of things. And also, I think the major problem for the pan-democrats uh, or, or, or me is that um, if, we have, if we only have uh, 10 seconds or 15 seconds to talk about uh, political agendas, <laughs> then what can we say? So we, we talk about the poverty first. Time Magazine. I had two questions, uh, but the first I was going to ask was just asked uh, a lot more eloquently and enthusiastically than I would have. So now I have just one, and that is, uh, what do you think is going to happen in March uh, with the next chief executive election? What do you hope to see happen? What is the best case scenario? What is the worst case scenario? Is there a best case scenario? Hmm. Actually, the, for me, the worst scenario do not, uh, does not happen in March. The worst scenario is f uh, for a mild candidate to be elected, and then he will, with the order of Beijing to propose a, uh, another, uh, another proposal for political reform. And then some of us in the Democratic camp will most probably uh, agree with it. So that will, uh, that will be a huge problem uh, in our fight for democracy. So the problem did not, I mean, does not align exactly on who will be the next um, chief executive. So um, my idea and my, uh, what I have to do in these few months is to uh, 
is to warn all of uh, us uh, in the democratic camp that uh, whoever you support is not the major problem. But the problem is uh, we, don't, we don't make deals with him. We don't make deals with him, in particularly political deals. So we will not lose hope uh, for our future of the democratic movement. Are you referring to John Chung in particular? As yeah, yeah, I'm candidate? quite afraid that he will be elected. <laughs> Question over yeah, here. Because, because yeah. the democratic camp, I mean, they approved the budget that he proposed this year. That was the most <laughs> weird thing I heard of this year. So the explanation is, well, John Chung is uh, quite a nice guy. <laughs> Between uh, different power networks, and that can make us, um, I mean, that can make us more relevant. So this is the first thing I will do. Second, second thing is uh, some of the issues that I try to bring up are uh, still new issues for the Legislative Council, just like the reformation of Hang Yi Kok I am proposing. So uh, there are still room for, I mean, opening up discussions for certain issues, and I hope I can uh, let Hong Kong people uh, be more aware of the collusion of landlord and mafia groups and, and, and the government, in particularly in the new territories, because uh, the future of the new territories, the rural environment, decides what Hong Kong will be. Right over here at this table. Um, thank you. Janelino from the Australian Consulate. Um, you mentioned your desire to change the basic law. So my question is, by what mechanism would you get the NPC to adopt amendments to the basic law? Because as I understand it, that is the only way that it can be amended. And secondly, is there not a danger in reopening the basic law that Beijing might actually try to change some of the other articles such as freedom of speech or education or academic freedom um, as well as liberalising something like Article 158. Thank you. Well, uh, for the Chinese government, everything is not about procedure. <laughs> it's about power, political power. And I think, uh, so, our responsibility is to get as much power as we can. So that's the only way. So I. Uh, what I'm talking about is I, I, I do not agree that kind of de facto referendum proposed by uh, other political groups. I, I don't think that, it, that will give a real threat to Beijing. Uh, the real threat is, as I've said, majority in the Legislative Council. This is the only way. So I hope um, more things can be done uh, in the functional constituency. Uh, for, this, for this term, this election, uh, we have not uh, working hard enough in registration of certain in certain functional constituencies like the like the catering uh, seat so uh, we will plan it earlier so uh, hopefully if we can have uh, one or two more seats next time in the geographical constituency and three more seats in the functional constituency then we can achieve our goal. So at that time, we will talk about how to make change on what article and whatever. So for the, so the, second, um, for the second question, um, my good friend, uh, Margaret Ng, uh, the former legislator, always uh, remind me of this point. Uh, but I think that um, the problem we are facing now is uh, uh, we can wait no longer. To, 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 we cannot keep ourselves stuck in this situation. Um, we will, young people cannot wait, and they will, I mean, they will break, I mean, I mean uh, um, much more uh, violent actions will be taken if we do not, I mean, uh, if we do not draw their power or, or draw their attention to the political process in legislative council and social movement. So uh, I, I, I would rather take the risk than not doing anything. We'll go over to the veranda here and then come back. 
Uh, hello, Andrew Wood from BBC News. And I find politics in Hong Kong very difficult because there isn't any. All you talk about is pro-establishment or um, pan-democrat, uh, self-determination. Nobody ever talks about what you would do with that self-determination. In America, you have the Republicans and you have the Democrats. Now, okay, perhaps the Republican side at the moment is a bit weird. But on the whole, you know in America what Democrats stand for, what Republicans stand for. You know in the UK what the Labour Party stands for, what the Conservatives stand for, left wing, right wing. I have no idea in Hong Kong what anybody stands for. Are you in favor of higher taxes, lower taxes, a welfare oh, okay. state, reformation? <laughs> Sorry, there's a lot of questions, so I... <laughs> yes. I mean, what do you stand for? What are you going to do with this self-determination? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, but I mean, it's also, I, I, I'm sorry to, to, to tell you that uh, our situation is pretty much like Taiwan. So we have, uh, have uh, pro-unification and pro-independence. So in Hong Kong, pro-Beijing and, uh, and, and pro-democracy is... But what's the point having democracy, more democracy, self-determination, if you don't actually have any policies for people to vote for? Actually, um, within, the, within the camp of uh, uh, the pan-democrats and also the self-determination, we, uh, we have in our political platforms uh, ideas about economy, about uh, uh, preservation of the environment, about social welfare. But the problem for, I think, is quite difficult for uh, foreign journalists to make sense out of it because uh, the major issues, the major issues put uh, uh, on, on the front page is always about uh, uh, pro or against Beijing. So Beijing, I think, is also responsible for, for making this um, impression. So, uh, I, will, I will, if you have time, talk more about my ideas, about economy, about all, all sorts of things. And also, I think the major problem for the pan-democrats uh, or, or, or me is that um, if, we have, if we only have uh, 10 seconds or 15 seconds to talk about uh, political agendas, <laughs> then what can we say? So we, we talk about the priority first. We have a question over here on the veranda. Um, just before we go to the question, we will run a little bit over 2 o'clock today because there are a lot of questions in the audience. So if you do feel you need to go, we understand, but we will run longer than the usual 2 o'clock for about five minutes. Time Magazine. I had two questions, uh, but the first I was going to ask was just asked uh, a lot more eloquently and enthusiastically than I would have. So now I have just one, and that is, uh, what do you think is gonna happen in March uh, with the next chief executive election? What do you hope to see happen? What is the best case scenario? What is the worst case scenario? Is there a best case scenario? Hmm. Actually, the, for me, the worst scenario do not, uh, does not happen in March. The worst scenario is, for, uh, for a mild candidate to be elected, and then he will, with the order of Beijing to propose a uh, another uh, another proposal for political reform, and then some of us in the democratic camp will most probably uh, agree with it. So that will, uh, that will be a huge problem uh, in our fight for democracy. So the problem did not, I mean, does not align exactly on who will be the next um, chief executive. So um, my idea and my, uh, what I have to do in these few months is to, uh, is to warn all of uh, us uh, in the democratic camp that, uh, Whoever you support is not the major problem. But the problem is uh, we, don't, we don't make deals with him. We don't make deals with him, in particularly political deals. So we will not lose hope uh, for our future of the democratic movement. Are you referring to John Chung in particular? As yeah, yeah, I'm candidate? quite afraid that he will be elected. 
question over yeah, here. Because, because yeah. the Democratic camp, I mean, they approved the budget they he proposed this year. That was the most weird thing I heard of this year. So the explanation is, well, John Chen is uh, quite a nice guy. <laughs> I think I've been talking to a lot of people, uh, and they're getting very worried about Hong Kong, where it's going to be. Because more and more, more we see the democratic movements and uh, the fight for freedom, um, it's become more confrontational. Uh, and, and it is not really helping the economy, right? I mean, the government trying to do things and you're filibustering, uh, and nothing gets done. I mean, while all the other countries are, are progressing, uh, or, or at least seems to be progressing, and, and, and what are you doing actually trying to help Hong Kong? I mean, people besides just talk about freedom of, of speech, and, uh, and we also need to think about livelihood, you know. Oh, the one who do not care the livelihood of Hong Kong people is the government uh, themselves. Well, we want universal, I mean, you, um, we want a universal pension for our, for our, elder, for our elderly. And um, we want a more fair housing uh, system that not so much land are sold to real estate developers, but more are spare for uh, affordable housing. But I mean, the government did not listen to us. So, and I also heard uh, uh, an information that you may help me to check uh, in this morning. Uh, James Toe said more, actually more than 90% of the motions or, or legislation uh, or budget proposal proposed by uh, the government uh, were passed by the Legislative Council in the last term. So I don't think, I don't think that a uh, few cases of filibuster is, is really, I mean, damaging to the economy of Hong Kong. It's, uh, it's a myth for me. So uh, the problem is, the problem for me is uh, uh, I myself, I don't want violent confrontation. So my way of uh, stopping violent confrontation is to join the politics, join the political process. And, and I hope that uh, after the, the fishbowl riot uh, in early this year, more, more young people, uh, even those who are advocating for independence, they can think twice before uh, starting another uh, violent actions. And I think they are, I mean, this election is quite fruitful for me. Uh, even the most radical young people are, are participating in it and, and doing campaign. And this is, I mean, a good uh, sign that uh, in the future, uh, the Podemos form of, uh, of, of uh, organization uh, can have more support. And I think that that is uh, a way of Hong Kong people to learn what democracy is and uh, to be more powerful in the fighting for democracy, um, so on and so forth. And, and so it's a very good sign for me. And I, and I, and I want to be, uh, because I'm near 40 years old and I quite, I mean, that those, uh, those teenagers who are uh, advocating for independence in the secondary school, I want to be, become friends with them and learn more from them. We have time for two more questions. We'll take one here and then over there. Uh, Philip Bowring, a freelance journalist. The retirement of uh, Lao Wang Pat, uh, what hope does this give you that the Heng Yi Cook can be broken up and that uh, land issues in the new territories can be resolved? Mm. Actually, I, I, I don't want the Heng Yi Cook to be broken up. Because uh, if it is broken up, then um, I think the power that will replace it is the real estate developers. So, uh, but I, actually I have found a loophole in the system in order to reform it. Uh, uh, Junius Ho, uh, the former uh, chairman of Tu Moon uh, Rural Committee, taught, uh, taught me, well, by his practice, that uh, in order to make uh, the rule committee a more democratic one, uh, the only way or the, the, the best way is to 
uh, join the village representative election and then to be the majority in a certain rule committee and then you can change the um, uh, change the what the, the, the constitution well constitution of the rule committee in order to make things more democratic so the uh, what we are having right now is a mafia group leader they are uh, exploiting uh, the present system in order to get the seat of chairman of rule committee so and they are kicking out uh, good villagers uh, so my plan, uh, because I have uh, within the more than uh, 84,000 votes I have, uh, there are in every rural area, I got around 20% of the votes. So what I'm proposing is uh, these people, my supporters, to come out and uh, register in the village representative election. And then we can, uh, in two, 2018, uh, have our own candidates in maybe first of all 10 villages or 20 villages, and then we can uh, make this, uh, well, I will help them. Uh, in Legislative Council, I will uh, start a whatever discussion in the Legislative Council that uh, which part of the Hong Yi Code and Rule Committee should be changed. And then on the other part, uh, my supporters in different villages and different rural areas will come out and be part of a bottom-up movement to change how you go. I, I don't think I can do it in four years time, but uh, uh, many of them are quite optimistic that, uh, that um, democracy is the only power we have to, uh, to, to, um, to stop land loss uh, from exploiting our land. So to make it a more democratic institution is, uh, 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 a, a not bad way, and I will I will talk to uh, Ken Nif uh, Lau, the present uh, chairman of Hong Yi Kok, uh, in a few days' time. So I will bring this issue to him. We're just going to take one last question here. Yes, Paul Zimmerman, and I, I, you talk about reform the Hong Yi Kok from the inside up, uh, but how about from top down? Uh, the Hong Yi Kok uh, ordinance clearly says that it's the people of the new territories that's supposed to represent. Right now, the indigenous villages are 800,000 out of the 4 million, so it's only 20%. So the Hung Yi Kuk is not representing um, the way it should. Um, and if I, if I put one more perspective to this, 1977, McLehose wrote to England prior to the Cook visit to the UK that the Cook is led by a group of self-interested millionaires, for the most part speculated in land, and it will be most unwise to lose sight either of their self-interest or the effrontery of their assertions. So um, nothing has changed since 1977, except that we have far many more uh, non-indigenous people living in the new territory. So isn't it time also to look at it top down? Yeah, Paul, are you proposing a JR on this? <laughs> we can talk about that we'll later. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for the ch a change in the uh, Home Eco Ordinance, um, uh, the first thing I want to change is to abolish uh, the appointed uh, membership in the Executive Council. Uh, Joshua Wa uh, Josh uh, Junius Ho is the newest uh, appointee. So, um, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I don't know how to, I, I, will, I will bring this issue um, up in the Legislative Council, and because the point is, um, even those millionaires in, inside the court are quite against this uh, particular article, because that led Beijing uh, 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 a very uh, open way to intervene in the business. So but for, for me, bottom-up uh, reformation is to make it more democratic, and uh, the top-down uh, reform is to help those, I mean, well, well we, have, um, we have common interests maybe, that uh, we should stop Beijing from intervening uh, the business of Hong Yi Kok. We're going to end on that note. Eddie Chu, thank you very much for coming thank today. Thank you, thank you. We do have a small gift from the club. Uh, I think it's a tie. We can, we can rethink that if you prefer, but 
Thank you very much. <laughs>